All right, welcome again, everyone. My name is Greta Zaro with World Beyond War, and I'm excited to be joining you for today's webinar. Um, people are just kind of coming in from the waiting room and getting settled in. You can use the chat box if you haven't yet to introduce yourself and say where you're calling in from. We are also recording today's webinar, so if you have to leave at any time, no worries, we will send out the recording afterwards. And we also have closed captioning available today if you'd like to use it. You can click on the CC live transcript button and there you can view the captions. Sometimes you have to click the, the more button and then you'll see the CC transcript button. So with that, I will pass it over to Larry to kick us off. Hello everyone and welcome. Uh, my name is Larry Gilbert and I am a co-coordinator of uh, Veterans for Peace, Chapter 136 in the Villages, Florida, as well as uh, a member of uh, the Central Florida chapter of World Beyond War. So it's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you today, Dr. Douglas Gransfield, who lives in Cape Elizabeth, Maine. He's a retired uh, pediatrician a father and grandfather. He was a neonatologist at Maine Medical Center and cared for infants in the newborn intensive care unit. He is secretary of PSR Maine, Physicians for Social Responsibility, Maine chapter, and the co-chair of the chapter's committee working to prevent nuclear war. PSR Maine actively promotes Back from the Brink, a call to work together towards a world free of nuclear weapons and advocate for common sense nuclear weapons policies to secure a safer and more just future. Doug enjoys speaking to the public as an opportunity to tell what is and can be done by individuals to end the risk of nuclear war. So without any further ado, I present uh, Doug Gransfield, I should say, Dr. Doug Gransfield. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here speaking to you from my home in Cape Elizabeth, Maine. Uh, I am representing PSR Maine and also the, the Back from the Brink work. I wanna thank particularly World Beyond War and the Veterans for Peace and the Florida chapters for inviting me to give this talk. And in particular, thank you, Larry, Larry Gilbert, who I know is the former mayor of Lewiston, Maine, who invited me to give this talk. And also a special thanks to Greta Zaro, who uh, has done all the legwork to make this webinar possible. And also thank you to the audience for tuning in uh, and for your interest. I assume that many of you have uh, thought about this topic in great detail, and I hope that my talk can uh, promote some discussion and some additional um, comments from you toward the end when we're in the question and answer session. Um, so PSR Maine does work to prevent things that we cannot cure. That includes not only nuclear uh, dangers, but the climate crisis and environmental toxins. The real reason I'm part of PSR Maine and why I, I wanna give this talk and wanna promote more discussion about it are my three grandchildren who are shown with me here uh, in a park uh, near my home. And uh, two of them are in Vermont and another one, the littlest one there, Rose is in South Portland. It's 77 years now since the United States was the first country to use atomic bombs. And uh, we've just passed that, that anniversary here in the beginning of August. On the left, you see the Hiroshima pictures from an airplane at about the same height before and after the bomb that's shown, the mushroom cloud that's shown above that, uh, took what was a thriving city and left it virtually wiped off the map. And Nagasaki's on the right with similar photographs showing similar levels of destruction. And it was with those two events within the space of three days that we embarked 
on nuclear age and the nuclear danger has been with us ever since. So why should it be doctors that are dealing with nuclear weapons? Why is it physicists and scientists and um, advising politicians? What, what role do physicians really have? Well, in fact, the United States government turned to physicians immediately after having dropped the bombs and sent physicians to Japan to gather information about the survivors of the Habakusha. The survivors um, were extensively examined. There were multiple year examinations um, and the files were kept for long periods of time. Correlations made with how far they were from where ground zero was, et cetera, et cetera. All this information was kept secret, not only not shared with uh, the citizens of this country, but also not shared with our allies. And because of that, people knew that the, they believed that the atomic bombs were responsible for ending World War II. But they thought of the bombs just as bigger versions in a smaller package of the same bombs we'd been using in World War II. And the equivalency that was developed to help people think that way was that they'd started describing nuclear bombs as far as how many tons of TNT had the uh, same effect as a, world, as a bomb in World War II, totally negating the fact that the, ex, the effects of the bomb were far in excess of just what was created by the blast from a bomb or the fire from a conventional bomb. So you can see that relatively the same size, the bomb that dropped on Hiroshima was 15,000 times more powerful than what was a very common bomb used in World War II of a one ton size. The, and similarly, because we thought of the bomb as just larger and didn't really understand what nuclear weapons truly meant, uh, the, the government was able to tell us and the military was able to tell us that we should be prepared to survive a nuclear attack, that therefore we should not fear it, and that we should be continuing to develop nuclear weapons because um, we could protect our citizens from that. And I'm sure many of you watching uh, participated in duck and cover drills with Bert the turtle, as these children are doing under their desks. And maybe even some of you had fallout shelters at your home, but it was civil defense. It was the idea that the world could be, uh, that we would survive. Yes, we might take some damage, but we would survive and continue to thrive as a nation. <laughs> To develop the weapons, they needed to be tested. And we continued to use Nevada in this country. This is a picture of a test being done in the, in the uh, Nevada desert with military personnel standing in the foreground there, totally unshielded, totally unprotected. Um, and as other countries developed weapons, uh, they also were tested around the world. And I'll show you that in a moment. But essentially, while weapons were being tested in the atmosphere, we tested over 2,000 nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. And they weren't small tests. Just a quarter of those, or about 528 of them, had the power, the explosive power, of more than 29,000 Hiroshima bombs. And the public was not informed of what was going on really. And certainly the people in the military didn't know what they were being exposed to. By uh, the mid 60s, uh, we had five nuclear nations. And this graph, this uh, cartoon drawing of the world shows that tests were being done by those five countries. The United States was doing tests in Nevada and also in the Pacific Islands. The United Kingdom was using the Pacific Islands and uh, Australia. USSR had testing sites three places within their own country, China a place within their country, and France used North Africa and, and the uh, South Pacific. What was being released was radiation and the three principal biologically important radio, radioactive elements that were released by the bombs were iodine-131, cesium-137, and strontium-90. This cartoon illustration here shows what would happen 
when, for instance, iodine-131 was released uh, in the radioactive explosion. It would go into the upper atmosphere. It would travel across the country from Nevada or travel across the ocean from the Pacific to neighboring islands. When the rain fell, that would bring the radiation down to the ground. It would be on the grass. Cows and other animals would eat that. Cows would incorporate it into the milk. We didn't know that it was being incorporated into the milk. Children drank the milk and took iodine-131 into their body. Iodine is concentrated in the body in the thyroid gland and the concentration of that radioactive material in the thyroid led to cancers in the thyroid gland years later. Cesium and strontium are elements that uh, replace calcium in the body and they were mostly found in teeth and in bones. So how are physicians responding to this? Well, as I said, mostly it was a secret, but physicians did know that radiation was being released. And this, what looks like your fourth grade teacher is Dr. Louise Race. She was a doctor, she was a pediatrician in St. Louis. And she knew that radiation was coming across St. Louis from the tests in Nevada. And she and others got the idea that if they could collect baby teeth from parents who had saved baby teeth from different ages, different times across the 1950s, that they could measure the amount of strontium and uh, cesium in the, in the teeth and get an idea of how much radioactivity was being concentrated in the teeth. They did this and they were very successful. Mothers and Fathers mailed in teeth by the thousands. They were able to analyze them. And they were able to show in a study that was published in 1963 that by 1963, the teeth in St. Louis had 50 times more radiation than the teeth from the children in 1950. This became publicized in the United States. Mothers became infuriated. Kennedy had to uh, deal with that. And he, and uh, the Russians and the Brits signed a limited test ban treaty that ended atmospheric testing in those countries and also uh, curtailed atmospheric testing by the other countries that were being developed. At the same time, other physicians were trying to gather data about the dangers of nuclear weapons and trying to get that information out to the public. This is a friend of Larry Gilbert's. He's a famous, uh, citizen of Lewiston, Maine, where, mayor, where Larry was mayor. He came as a child immigrant to Lewiston uh, and grew up there, went to school there, went to the University of Maine in Orono, went on to be a professor at Harvard and was a cardiologist. And he would be world famous as a cardiologist because he invented the defibrillator and he did the work that uh, developed into uh, the uh, regulation of pacemaker um, technology. But at the same time, he and other physicians at Harvard were coming to realize that the world needed to know about the dangers of nuclear weapons. And in fact, physicians needed to know about nuclear weapons. And as he says here, the real threat in the world was not cardiac, but nuclear. And he went on to say, how could I be a doctor and close my eyes to this overwhelming reality? This resulted in Dr. Lown and others of his colleagues getting the New England Journal of Medicine in 1962 to devote almost the entire uh, journal to articles having to do with the medical consequences of thermonuclear war. That put the world on notice and it presented in the death and destruction of nuclear weapons in cold clinical language. The world knew and physicians of the world knew that there was no adequate medical response to nuclear war, that there was no such thing as civil defense. And thus, as with any other incurable disease, physicians must do what's necessary to prevent it. So Larry and his colleagues had formed not only Physicians for Social Responsibility in this country, um, but they went on to form other organizations. An illustration that was in that art, in that journal, uh, I've adapted to a little bit more modern look of that. They showed the world 
what would happen if a bomb dropped on Boston the size of Nagasaki. And what you see here uh, in concentric rings are levels of destruction that decrease as you leave the epicenter, which is that uh, little symbol there with the nuclear sign. The very center, very center circle is the fireball. In the fireball, there are temperatures greater than the intensity of the heat of the sun and everything is vaporized. The next circle is blast at pressures of over 20 pounds per square inch. And in that circle, there's 100% for fatality. The green circle represents where the radiation is at or above 500 rems. Uh, and all of the people within that circle will be dead within one month from the effects of the radiation. The next two circles are a moderate blast and the outer brown circle is thermal radiation radius. Moderate blast means that most residential buildings would be destroyed. There would be, wide, there would be almost universal injury and widespread death. And the ring for thermal radiation is uh, where everybody in, in that ring would have third degree burns, uh, everybody. And the outer ring is where there is damage at one pound per square inch or above. Uh, sorry about this McAfee thing here. I can't get it to close. <laughs> Excuse me one second. Oh my, okay. Um, what I didn't say is, I, and I had that other slide up there, is that what they wanted everybody to know in the New England Journal was that all of the medical centers were within the green uh, radius circle. And there would be no ability to have any medical response to any of the injured people from the outlying area because the medical centers would be gone and all the people working in them would be dead. Updating that to what would happen at the same time, in the same year as the journal was published, if a Russian missile that was of the type being used at that time were to land on Boston, those missiles were over 2 million tons of TNT blast effect. And the blast, the area of uh, vaporization or the fireball area, you can see on the right there, and it includes almost all of central Boston. There would be nothing left of central Boston. And the estimated fatalities and the estimated injuries are based on uh, current day populations. And this modeling is done using the website that I, I uh, referenced here called NukeMap. And if you aren't familiar with Boston, you may be more familiar with Washington DC. So this is the same size bomb as if it was dropped on Washington DC. And you can see that almost all of downtown Washington would be vaporized and that there would be extensive damage uh, way out into the suburbs. Which brings us to the conclusion that the world is in our hands. And that's the left-hand picture. The right-hand picture, chillingly by comparison, is a sphere that represents the amount of plutonium fuel that is needed for a one megaton bomb. So clearly um, we have the world in our hands. I also wanna call attention to the person that illustrated this, decided to use uh, someone with a white skin to hold the ball. And I think that that's prophetic because I think it really is the, the countries that are mostly white uh, dominated in their governance that uh, are controlling this problem. Bernie Lowne was not done with physician when he created Physicians for Social Responsibility. He knew Russian physicians, and he knew that to extend the influence of physicians, he needed to form an international collaboration. So his friend, Dr. Chazov, who was a fellow cardiologist in Russia, he and Chazov began this International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War and enrolled thousands of physicians from around the country and started spreading the word internationally about the dangers of nuclear war. And for that, and in recognition of that, they were awarded 
the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985. It turns out that Chazov was the personal cardiology physician of Gorbachev at the time, and Laun had a way to communicate with Reagan. Both of them directly communicated with the two world leaders um, in the mid 80s and got them to really understand what was being risked by maintaining the nuclear weapons at the level they were as we were engaged aged in this Cold War depicted in the two cartoons. At a summit in 1986, uh, Gorbachev and Reagan agreed that nuclear war could not be won and that it must never be fought. And they came close to almost eliminating nuclear weapons at that time. If Reagan would have been willing to uh, give up his Star Wars defense, Gorbachev and he, I think, could have struck a deal to eliminate the nuclear weapons in both countries. But because Gorbachev thought that with Reagan maintaining the uh, Star Wars defense that he was hedging his bets, they weren't willing to get rid of their weapons. Nonetheless, the uh, Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty was signed in 87, and it did lead to the mutual verifiable uh, on-site inspection and verification of the fact that Russia and the United States destroyed almost 3,000 nuclear weapons by 2019. Here's what happened with nuclear weapons around the world. We start out in 1945 at a nice slow pace as the United States is the only one with weapons. Russia joins us in the late, in the early 50s and starts to make a few weapons we're actually unaware of how few they're actually making and think that there may actually be a missile gap, which there wasn't. We get into the 60s and on in as the um, Cold War progresses and other countries are joining, China, France, the United Kingdom. Then we go on and Israel joins, although we didn't know that until 1986, their nuclear weapons were kept secret. South Africa joined. South Africa is the only country that possessed nuclear weapons that they developed on their own that ever gave them up when um, the uh, apartheid government was ended. Uh, before they ended that government, they abandoned all nuclear weapons and destroyed them all. And then we went on to have Pakistan and India and finally North Korea. And you can see at the point where uh, Gorbachev and Reagan agreed to destroy nuclear weapons. We went from a peak of over 60,000 in the world, uh, precipitously down. And then what, unfortunately what happens after the end of the Cold War is we reach a plateau. And that number hasn't been going down in the last uh, 15 years. This is a timeline of how this country joined um, the nuclear club. Um, I won't dwell on that, having just talked about that some. Here's the current situation of the world nuclear inventories. You can see the two dominant circles are Russia and the United States. They have oh, almost 12,000 of the nuclear warheads that exist in the world. Um, that's over 90% of them. And the other countries have varying numbers. China had 350, it may be developing more. Uh, but essentially, even with China developing more, it's Russia and the United States that play the major role in trying to bring an end to uh, nuclear terror. So what's happened internationally in trying to control nuclear weapons since the end of the Cold War? Well, we know that the international, international physicians for the prevention of nuclear war remained active. And they came to realize that it was the non-nuclear countries in the world, the countries that had agreed not to develop nuclear weapons and, and uh, were therefore sort of held captive by the nuclear powers, that those were the countries that needed to go to the UN and try to petition for an end to this nuclear age. And so they formed an international organization called the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons or ICANW.org. And they started to have international meetings, convene international meetings with world leaders from around the world to plan for a UN treaty to eliminate nuclear weapons by stigmatizing them and by prohibiting them. And that work 
resulted in that organization being awarded the 19, excuse me, the 2017 uh, International uh, Nobel Peace Prize. When you see here on the right, uh, Beatrice Finn, who is the chairperson of ICANN, and one of the Hibachu, uh, Suzette Tu Thurlow, who's a Canadian citizen who was bombed in Hiroshima and survived receiving the uh, Nobel Prize on behalf of ICANN. I want to just read a little bit of what uh, Suzuko said in her acceptance speech. When I was a 13-year-old girl trapped in the smoldering rubble, I kept pushing. I kept moving toward the light, and I survived. Our light is now the ban treaty. Keep moving toward the light. I'm pleased to say that the UN treaty is now fully in effect. It's been signed by 80, 86 countries or 45% of the countries of the world. It went into force in 2017 when 50 of those 86 countries ratified it and are totally bound by it. There now are a total of 66 countries that have ratified it. And the treaty has the following prohibitions. The countries that are, are bound by this treaty uh, agree that they prohibit the use or threatening to use nuclear weapons. They prohibit the development of nuclear weapons in their country. They prohibit the testing of nuclear weapons. They prohibit the production and manufacture of nuclear weapons. And they pro prohibit the possession or stationing of nuclear weapons in their country. Let's get back to the United States and what we as people in the United States, I know some of you may be joining from other places outside the United States, but specifically citizens here in this country. Here's what we spend on nuclear weapons, uh, not on nuclear weapons, but on our total military budget um, in a year. And this graph makes the startling uh, point clear that in 2019, as it is today, the United States spent $732 billion, and that was mat to match that total expense, you needed to take the military expenditure of the next 10 countries spending the most for weapons. So you can see how small Russia's spending is compared to the United States. You can see how small China's is compared to the United States. Um, do we really need? to lead the world in spending by this much? Do we really need to be the world's policeman? Do we really need to have our army and our military presence around the world ready to respond at any moment? If we could reduce some of that expenditure, here's some things we could do with it instead. Here's some equivalencies in energy and environment. Um, we could, uh, generate power for 50,000 homes for $250 million. Uh, we could salvage and protect all the Superfund areas for one year for $681 million. And just to remind you, $732 billion. It's hard for me to even imagine that. So I went looking for what are some examples of how to think about that. One billion, uh, if you think of one billion in terms of time, and if every second, how many seconds would you need to get a billion seconds? Well, it would take you 31.69 years. And if you spent $100 a day, how long would you have to spend $100 a day to spend uh, $1 billion? Well, you'd have to spend money for 27,397 years. And instead of spending that money, we could fund Planned Parenthood, we could double Medicaid spending for a year, and we could provide 1 million families for one year of, with one year of health insurance. What is the situation with nuclear weapons in our country? Our country has what's called a triad of nuclear weapons. The fundamental portion of that triad now in 2022 are nuclear submarines. They're so-called Ohio-class submarines. We have long, we have from the very first had aircraft that could deliver uh, nuclear weapons. And that was 
the, after aircraft, we developed missiles, land-based missiles. The Minuteman III is the current version of that position all across uh, the interior of our country. So that triad exists to deliver um, all the weapons that are on standby. Not only does that triad exist, but there are plans to modernize all three portions of that triad to replace all the submarines with new type submarines, to replace all the missiles with new missiles, and to replace all the aircraft with new aircraft. That cost to do that is estimated to cost over the next 30 years, which is what it would take to do that, $1.2 trillion. That's $1,200 billion. So just to look at the submarines, the Ohio class submarines, there's 12 of them. They're in port, they're stationed out of Washington state and Georgia. Um, there are five of them in the oceans of the world at all times. And each submarine carries 20 missiles. Each missile has four warheads for a total of 80 warheads. And each warhead has the capacity of having 475,000 tons of explosive force. If you put all that together, one submarine, one submarine, if it fired all of its missiles and used all of its warheads, would generate the explosive force in one attack greater than all of the explosive force of the bombs used by all the militaries in all of World War II. So why do we have these weapons? What is our nuclear posture in the United States? The current, every president does what's called a nuclear posture review, where they ask uh, military, scientific, and other leaders to review how the United States should use nuclear weapons. President Biden has completed his nuclear posture review. It has not been made public but it has been released in a classified form to Congress. And the Defense Department did put out uh, what I'm quoting here in a two page uh, posting online, summarizing what they thought uh, were the main points of our posture review. And essentially our country continues to maintain that we have nuclear weapons so that we will deter other nations from attacking us with nuclear weapons or in fact attacking us at all. They believe that uh, no nation would risk uh, the nuclear retaliation from our country and therefore no country would, would uh, attack us. That of course assumes that it's a country that's led by rational sane people, that it's not terrorists, uh, but it's an effective uh, functional government. So just to highlight some of the things that it said, we need a safe, secure and effective nuclear deterrence and the fundamental role of US nuclear weapons is to, is to deter nuclear attack on the United States, our allies and partners. So you see that the umbrella covers not just the United States, but those of us that we, with whom we have treaties. And most significantly is the sentence that we would, states would consider the use of nuclear weapons in extreme circumstances meaning not nuclear attacks to defend the vital interests of the United States or its allies or partners. That is the United States maintains a policy that it reserves the right to use nuclear weapons first, just as it did in World War II. So let's look at some of these policies in the United States that destabilize our country. Certainly first use is a destabilizing uh, factor. Uh, it, is uh, one that means that we keep our weapons on constant alert. It means that we have designed a system to use the weapons that requires only the president to authorize the use of the weapons. So clearly maintaining this first use policy, which is a policy that China does not have uh, and uh, that we uh, in maintaining that uh, maintain a possibility of nuclear uh, attack occurring by accident or by miscalculation. 
Presidential sole authority, there's a problem with that as well. The president has the ability to contact the necessary officials in the Pentagon at a moment's notice. He is always accompanied by somebody that allows him to do that. He can present the situation to the Pentagon and the Pentagon does not have to agree with him. So long as any people in the Pentagon are willing to execute an order uh, for the president, they will send out the code, which is what's shown in that square labeled Pentagon, that complex uh, uh, alphabetic code there. It would be sent secretly and undetectably to uh, submerged nuclear submarines uh, that cannot be located uh, using current technology. Once the captain and two executive officers have, have confirmed that this is a legitimate uh, attack order, they open the safe, they take out the keys, and the launch crew is able to launch the missiles on the uh, submarine. So to do that and to be able to do that, we keep all of the missiles in the nuclear submarines that are deployed and at sea on ready alert, what's called launch on warning or hair trigger alert. And that's true for all of the intercontinental ballistic missiles that are in the underground silos throughout the United States. Before we had missiles and uh, submarines, we used to keep aircraft in the air constantly uh, loaded with uh, armed nuclear weapons, flying patterns that could be at any moment uh, ordered to attack uh, Russia at that time or another target. The airplanes no longer carry nuclear weapons or are no longer maintained in the air, but they are in the ground and the weapons are uh, ready to be loaded and ready to be activated. We think that this policies and these policies should be changed. We think that the risk of nuclear war can be reduced by that. And the Positions for Social Responsibility and the Union for Concerned Scientists decide, decided to start a national movement called Back from the Brink. Thus the title of the talk today, Back from the Brink of Nuclear War as a way to try to prevent nuclear war. And it has five policy changes that are endorsed by the Back from the Brink call. One is actively pursuing a verifiable agreement among nuclear armed states to eliminate their nuclear arsenals. That agreement exists and it's just a matter of getting countries to sign on to it. It's the UN Treaty for the Prevention of Nuclear War. Two, the United States should renounce the option of using nuclear weapons first. Three, the United States should end the sole unchecked authority of any US president to launch a nuclear attack. Four, the United States should take nuclear weapons off hair trigger alert. And five, the US, United States should cancel the plans to replace the entire US nuclear arsenal with enhanced weapons. This call, this back from the brink, is supported by 416 organizations nationally and the sponsors of this talk, uh, World Beyond War and Veterans for Peace are among those sponsors, as well as church groups, science groups, peace groups, environmental groups. Many, many groups um, have endorsed this. As well, municipalities across the country have uh, endorsed it here in Maine. Three municipalities have our two cities, Portland and Bangor, that are majority cities and a smaller town called Hallowell. But you can see that across the country, countries, uh, cities that range in size from Hallowell, Maine, to Baltimore, Maryland, Philadelphia, Chicago, Honolulu, San Francisco, Salt Lake, Portland, Tucson, have endorsed this call for back from the brink. And that brings me to what we can do and what we can do to uh, prevent nuclear war. And that is that you can, in the organizations that have sponsored this talk and by contacting Back from the Brink uh, at the, address, the web address that's shown here, uh, you can personally endorse the call for Back from the Brink and you also can learn how to get an organization that you may be a member of to endorse it, and also how to approach your own municipality about endorsing it.
I thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Doug. Very, very informative. And we have about 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, folks who wanna ask questions, you can either put your questions in the chat or because we do have sort of an intimate group, um, I think we can allow people to unmute as well. So feel free to use the raise hand feature, which you can find in the reactions tab and click raise hand and we will call on you. So I will try to sort of alternate back and forth between raised hands and questions coming in from the chat, of which we have many already. Um, so the first question from Al Mitty, who is actually one of the chapter coordinators for the uh, Florida chapter of World Beyond War. Uh, he would love to hear your opinion, Doug, on the PSA that came out from New York City. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of it or saw it, which was this public service announcement where New York City was talking about how you can survive a nuclear attack and it was quite controversial. So yeah, what's your opinion on that? And is the ad still running or is there any response? I don't know if the ad's still running. I think it's, um, I think I've shown the evidence that, that uh, this is just total deception that uh, people can survive a nuclear attack or that uh, trying to plan for it is somehow reasonable. Uh, you know, conceivably a small terrorist nuclear device set off in New York City, people could protect themselves from the radiation, but a true nuclear uh, event, there's no uh, uh, surviving that. There's no medical response to that. Uh, and it's just total deception. And that's the position of PSR. Okay, let's go to a raised hand. Um, Ruth, you can now unmute. Thank you. Um, that was a stunning talk. Very, very well organized. And I learned a lot of new information. Um, and, and I'm, you know, even though I'm a physician and I've been with PSR, I'm pretty ignorant about things. When you talk about, you know, the warheads that we have and Russia has, are these conventional or are they all nuclear, this 5,000 and 6,000? No, those are all nuclear warheads. Okay. You know, they all um, are, you know, the standard one is like uh, 400,000 tons of explosive force. Um, well, I was just going to make one other point. A personal friend of mine is Ted Postal, who's a physicist and um, part of a lot of nuclear groups. And he made the point in a uh, conference with Mearsheimer and Ray McGovern, et cetera, that um, that Russia's detection systems are much more primitive than ours, and that it's easy to make a, for Russia to make a mistake about something incoming, mistake it, and think that it's a nuclear weapon, and then launch and then start, you know, nuclear Armageddon, basically. Thank you, Ruth. We've actually come very close to that. There was an incident uh, where. Um, uh, the Russians mistook uh, something on the radar over Norway as the start of a nuclear attack. Fortunately, the general that was in charge of responding to that uh, waited uh, a moment, didn't call the premier uh, to start the attack. And uh, it soon became evident that it was the moon rising uh, rather than a, a real attack. So, um, then there've been multiple examples of that. If you look at, uh, uh, c command and control, the book. Uh, there's documented many, many of those. Thank you, Ruth, for your comments. Thanks. Yeah. And there's an amazing film, The Man Who Saved the World, that tells that story of that almost nuclear war when the general would had to make that really difficult decision and say, oh, I don't think this is actually a nuclear attack. Um, okay, we have another question. Um, has the AMA, I assume that's the American Medical Association, has the AMA endorsed uh, back from the brink? Has it been raised as an issue to the AMA? Um, the full AMA has not endorsed it. Um, but if you go to the website, you can see the medical organizations that have. Here in Maine, our Maine Medical Association uh, has endorsed back from the brink, uh, as have um, other organizations. The uh, American Public Health Association uh, as a national organization has endorsed back from the brink, uh, however. 
Great. Okay, let's go to Barb and Roy. You can now unmute. What scares me the most about our country is in 2002, you may recall how our government said Iran, Iraq had the potential of nuclear weapons that could land on the United States. 30 days after World Trade Center, we were at war with those countries and then went to war with seven more countries, which we're still at war with. Now the sabers seem to be rattling to go after Iran. I don't know if I believe what I'm hearing on TV about the news about Iran and its nuclear capability when Israel and the United States have the strongest military in the world. Would you like me to comment on that? Uh, yes, do you, this is to me is a threat to, for nuclear war under false pretenses. Barb, I share your concern. I think what we need to have is we need to have the International Atomic Energy Association get their inspectors into Iran and uh, actually get uh, access to uh, what Iran is doing there. Uh, I would trust that organization's report, um, but I, I share your concern that um, there is uh, misinformation uh, abundantly available about nuclear capabilities, not only of Iran, but of other countries around the world. They did sign the UN Non-Proliferation Agreement in 2002, Iran and Iraq, allowing UN inspectors in and they found nothing. Exactly. Of course, that may have changed now, but it didn't prove any success for those countries who went to war with Iraq anyway. Yeah, poor uh, General Powell was misled and manipulated, I'm afraid. He apologized a few months before he died for the misinformation he gave at the UN. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Barb. Thank you, Barb. Um, let's go to another question here from Bob. Um, if Russia launches a small nuclear weapon on Ukraine, what should the US response be? Well, I can't begin to say what the response should be, but I'll tell you what I hope the response would be. I would hope the response would be uh, to send all possible aid to the Ukraine and not to respond uh, with a nuclear strike. Um, that would be um, catastrophic. Uh, it would initiate, <laughs> well, it just would be catastrophic. I, I would hope that there wouldn't be a response, but who knows really? That's what's so dangerous. And that's one of the reasons why we need to eliminate presidential sole authority. That's why we need to be able to eliminate the launch on warning. Um, you know, we, we need to have some space and time between an event before we respond. We need to actually count to 10 at least uh, and think about what we're doing. Okay, let's go to Cynthia of Code Pink Golden Gate. Cynthia, you can now unmute. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dransfield, for your presentation. And I'm an activist and I'm uh, wanting to really focus on preventing nuclear war. So I'd love to know what your advice is to activists on the best way to use our time and energy to, to prevent this from happening. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. I really believe in this back from the brink call. I think organizing to try to get municipalities and organizations to endorse that is very effective. Um, it, we've, in Maine, we're fortunate that we're a small state and we can get access to our senators and our representatives. It's pretty easy for us to do that. And um, a collective group of uh, organizations that are endorsing Back from the Brink here in Maine have met with Senator King and our two representatives, Pingree and, and, and Golden, uh, and presented this information. And having those endorsements uh, by the organizations and by the municipalities really uh, does influence things. And people can then as individuals uh, petition their own state legislatures and their own federal legislators to, to raise this as an issue. So I, I would encourage you to use Back from the Brink as your tool. Thank you. Great. Um, we have a question from Ruth in the chat. Um, do you know how the doomsday clock is set? I think it's something like 100 seconds to midnight, which is 
you know, sort of very, very, it's saying that we're very close to the, the brink of nuclear war. Do you know how that is determined? Um, it's the bulletin of the atomic scientists that uh, publish that every year. And it's uh, members of that group that establish it. And they bring together not only the nuclear dangers, but also the environmental dangers that they see um, with the environmental crisis. They've started to incorporate that in there. In truth, the environmental crisis and nuclear weapons are, are conjoined danger because the more unstable the world gets with environmental uh, crisis, the more likely it is we're going to stumble into a nuclear war. Um, I don't know, you know, how they weight the different events and how they come up with the exact uh, ticking of the clock, but those are the things that they consider and that's who does it. Okay, let's go to Rosemary. You can now unmute. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify uh, from the beginning with those stats. Was that using Hiroshima-sized nuclear bombs, the impact on Boston or Washington, D.C., or was that with current size nuclear bombs? Those, the, the original one I showed was a Nagasaki-sized bomb on okay. Boston the one with the multiple rings. The next two were using a 1962 sized USSR warhead. That they were using warheads at that time of 2. Point, some 2.4 megatons, million tons of TNT explosive force. Um, I don't think their warheads are that big anymore. The United States certainly doesn't have warheads that big, but it, um, you know, I. I used it to make a point of what was going on at the time they were publishing the article. Okay, I actually thought ours were it? much bigger than, than what they were with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but I don't know that Russia, you know, period and, and what the size of their bombs were. Yeah, well, as I said, the United States, the typical warhead uh, on one of the submarine launch missiles, there's four of them and those each are, each of the four are 470 some, thousand tons of TNT explosive force. Uh, so that's, well, multiply 15, divide 15 into 470, and that's how many multiples of Hiroshima it is. I, I wanted to mention too, I'm in New York City, and I only saw that PSA once about, you know, basically duck and cover, like we're going back to the 1950s. There was an article in the Times, which was, frankly, I thought inane, because they were commenting about protests against it because there have been protests against it, but it was more focused on, oh, it made people afraid and not on the, the impotence of what they were recommending in that PSA to protect yourself from a nuclear weapon. So I don't know where it stands now, but I haven't seen it and there have been protests against it. Thank you, Rosemary. That's good information. Okay, we're just about out of time. Um, there were a few questions like, is there a comprehensive list where we can see all of the cities that have signed on? Or uh, there were some questions like, have UU churches signed on? I guess, is there one place where we could check which organizations and which cities have signed on? So the two websites I would use for that information are preventnuclearwar.org. That's the Back from the Brink site. And if you go to that site, um, they list all the organizations, all the municipalities that have endorsed it. If you go to icanw.org, that's the ICANN site, there's a great deal of information about the UN treaty. They list who's endorsed it, who signed it, who hasn't. They have uh, comments from countries both for and against uh, there's a lot of information there. So I would direct you to those two places. Uh, PSR has information about it, psr.org. But I would, I, I think for the purposes of what you want to know, I'd use those, those first two websites. Great, thank you. Yeah, and we will send a follow-up email to all the registrants with the recording, and we can also send those websites in that email. Um, so we are just about out of time. Oh, there's a question. Can we send your slides in that email as well? Um, I have no problem sending my slides. I think I'm going to delete the pictures of my grandchildren, but uh, otherwise, yes. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, we're just about out of time. I guess any final words, Doug or Larry? Uh, I'd just like to say that those who uh, may have registered and didn't get to see the presentation now, they will receive the recording. So in the future, when we send out uh, invitations, uh, I would even if you know you can't make that particular date and time uh, to register, and because then you will receive the recording. So, uh, and I just want to thank uh, Dr. Doug Bransfield for this outstanding presentation. I heard him on uh, on remembering uh, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki day that we had honoring Dr. Bernard Lown here in Lewiston, Maine on August 6th. And I found his presentation to be so informative that I asked him to uh, be a presenter here today. So thank you, Doug. We very much appreciate it. Thank you, Larry. My pleasure. Thanks everyone for, for joining us. Thanks everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.